Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to look at electron configurations. And we're going to be focusing on the first four learning objectives that are stated here for chapter three. Pause the video now to read over them to make sure you understand where we'll be going. The first thing that we need to do is talk about an experiment that was done in 1922 by German physicists O. Stern and W. Gerlach. Essentially what they did is they shot a, a stream of electrons through a pair of magnets. And what they observed was that the electrons congregated into two areas. And they were deflected up by one magnet and down by the other magnet. What they had expected, however, was that they, would, they should have seen essentially an infinite number of directions that they would be deflected depending on the orientation of the electron and its magnetic poles. Because they observed that there was only two locations where the electrons ended up, they concluded that there are two forms, if you will, of electrons. In other words, they, they determined that the magnetic spin is quantized, that it has discrete values. And since it only ended up with two, we have two spin values for electrons. That brings us to our fourth quantum number, which we call the spin quantum number. And just to remind you, we talked about already the principal quantum number, which describes the size of the um, the size of our orbitals. L, which is our angular momentum quantum number, this describes the shape of an orbital. M subscript L, that is the magnetic quantum number. And that tells us about the orientation in space or the direction that an orbital is facing. These two combined describe the subshell 1s, 2s, 3p, etc. All three of these combined describe a specific orbital. With the fourth quantum number, the spin, we now can start talking about specific electrons within those orbitals. And so it tells us about the direction of the magnetic moment of an electron. It can be either spin up or spin down. The designation of plus one half, minus one half is really arbitrary for our purposes. But we do want to be consistent with the terminology. And this brings us to what is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And the Pauli exclusion principle states that no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. So let's say that we describe an orbital as n equals 1, l equals 0, m sub l equals 0. Within there, so that we might describe as a line, sometimes you might see it as a box, the 1s orbital, you can have up or down. You cannot have up and up. This is impossible. And that's essentially saying that those two electrons are occupying the same space. So as I just illustrated here, each orbital can contain two electrons, but they have to have opposite spin. Again, this is good. This is bad. 
and that if two electrons occupy the same orbital, we say that they are paired. If they occupy, if they're alone, we say that they're unpaired. So both of these represent an unpaired electron. This represents a paired electron. And it turns out that we observe this phenomenon, Pauli exclusion principle, every day. The very fact that the electrons within our body cannot occupy the space of other electrons means you can't walk through walls. It means when you put your hand down on the table that it can't go and occupy that same space as the electrons of the other table. All right, let's check and see if you understood here what we just talked about. If we have an electron in a 4p orbital, what are the quantum numbers for that electron? Well, a 4p means that n equals 4 and l equals 1. m sub l values range between negative l and positive l. And that means the possible values for m sub l are negative 1, 0, and 1. And m sub s values are only plus 1 half or minus 1 half. And because we're not specifying if it's spin up or spin down, either of those could be correct. And that would lead us then to three possible combinations. In all cases, n equals 4 and l equals 1, but we can have varying m sub l values and then also varying m sub s values. So we could actually have then for each one of these as two combinations. total of six. So there's six combinations that could describe a single electron within a 4p type orbital. All right, let's review a little bit what we talked about in an earlier video. We described how orbital energy, first of all, it's energy that's the energy that when we put an electron into an orbital, energy is given off. And that's because there's an attractive interaction between the electron and the nucleus. The pen is acting up today. And we described how the energy levels for the Bohr model, for the hydrogen atom, all of the third shell orbitals are the same energy. All of the second shell orbitals are the same energy. Well, when it comes to other electron or other elements, this simply is not the case. The Bohr model describes the energy perfectly for elements that have a single electron, hydrogen, helium missing with with one electron gone, lithium with two electrons gone, those follow the Bohr model. However, when we look at the neutral forms of those elements or other elements, then it simply does not hold up. And it turns out that the energy levels for the orbitals with, within a given shell start to split. And so what we see is that shells are split in other words 3s is not equal to 3p which is not equal to 3d etc but sh subshells are the same in other words all of the orbitals within the 3d subshell are the same energy and the reason for this is because it turns out that we're no longer looking at just the nuclear charge. The, the number of protons. But what we call the effective nuclear charge. And in other words, this is the observed nuclear charge for a given electron. This splitting 
of orbital energies within the shells is due to a phenomenon that we call screening. So let's first, to understand, understand screening, we need to understand what Z-effective is. As I mentioned before, Z-effective is the amount of nuclear charge experienced by a given electron. It's what it feels, quote unquote. And if we have the nucleus attracting an electron, it's also going to be repelled by other electrons that are within its vicinity. If we add in more electrons, then now we're getting repulsion not only between the electrons within the same subshell, but also now the inner electrons are repelling the outer electrons and vice versa. Due to this added repulsion, it changes the observed level of attraction. Think of it this way. Imagine that you've got a fire and you're with your friends and you're sitting around the fire in, um, in two rows. And so if you've got someone, this is my poor attempt at drawing a chair. Let's pretend those are chairs and that there's people sitting on them. If you're sitting right here, let's say in position A, you're going to feel the full heat given off by the fire. If you're sitting at position B, you're also going to feel the full heat given off by the fire. But what if you're at position C or position D and someone's sitting in front of you? They're going to be blocking you and it's going to feel as though the fire has a lower intensity. And it's the same phenomenon that occurs when we deal with electrons that are shielding or blocking the outer electrons from the nucleus. So we might say that the inner or the core electrons are repelling or are shielding, excuse me, are shielding the valence electrons in, an, in a process that we call shielding or screening. So they're blocking the outer electrons from the interaction with the nucleus. We, couldn't, we can quantify this. Um, a good approximation of the effective nuclear charge is equal to the actual nuclear charge, number of protons, minus a screening constant. And you can think of this as the average number of electrons between the nucleus and the electron in question. So in this case, let's say that we have If there are five protons in the nucleus, if we have two core electrons and one valence electron, what's the Z effective for each? Well, the core, there's nothing in between it and the nucleus. And so we have, again, Z minus S, Z is five, five protons minus zero. So it's Z effective is five. But for this valence electron here, there are two core electrons. And so we have five minus two. It experiences an effective nuclear charge of approximately three. Now, it turns out that the exact numbers are a little bit more complicated than that. But you would only ever need to do an approximation using this type of a method. And it's because the, the core and the valence are affecting each other in this way that we get the shell's energy levels are splitting. Let's take a little bit, a look, another look at what that, what that means. So if you remember when we talked about wave functions and electron density, this is one of the graphs that we saw that's in the ebook. It, it looks at the radial probability. Or in other words, how far out how far out from the nucleus the 
the electrons can be. And what we see is that it turns out that while the majority of the electron density of the 2s electrons are, uh, are farther out, they actually have some probability of being here. And that means that they are, there's a possibility that the electrons are closer to the nucleus than the 2p orbital electrons. And what this does is this means that the 2s electrons are shielding the 2p electrons. So even though they're in the same shell, the fact that they're in different size, different shaped orbitals means that one of them, the 2s electrons, are repelling or shielding the 2p electrons. And what this does is this means that the 2s electrons are closer to the nucleus and are therefore lower in energy. Remember when we looked at Coulomb's law, we said that the energy is proportional to the charges over the distance. Well, since the distance for the 2s electrons is lower than the distance for the 2p electrons, that means that the magnitude of interaction, that's the strength of that energy, is larger for the 2s electrons. And so this leads to a pattern. And this pattern is the same for all different shells, the three, the third shell, the fourth shell, etc. It applies for any given n value. All right, let's see if you've got that. Go ahead and pause the video and try and solve this problem, and then I'll work it for you. Welcome back. Okay, so we want to put the following sets of orbitals in a multi-electron atom in order of increasing energy from lowest to highest. Well, remember that if it's multi-electron atoms, then we can follow the two rules that we just talked about. One is that for, this should be two, excuse that, for elements that have this, or for orbital, for, the, for subshells that have the same L value, different shell, same L, same shape, then they go from low to high energy going from the first shell to the second shell to the third shell. So in other words, the 1s electrons are lower in energy than the 2s, which are lower than the 3s, etc. We also know that for orbitals that are within the same shell, but that have different L values, that they also increase by increasing L value. So L equals zero is less than L equals one, which is less than L equals two, et cetera, in terms of their energy. And so then ranking the first set, we would get that the 2s is lower than the 3s, which is lower than the 4s. Ranking the second set, we have to combine these two rules. First, we see that the 1s is lower than the 2s, but also that the 2s is lower than the 2p. So we could have broken that up into two different sets, like this, which we then combine. And then the third one is simply the second rule, and that is that we have increasing energy based upon increasing L values. Now something to pay attention to is that this is the way it was because we had a multi-electron atom. If it were single, then we would have 1s, 2s, then the 2p, then the 3s, 3p, 3d, and then the 4s, etc. So this is if we had a single electron, this is for multi-electron. Okay, that's it for this lecture. If you have questions, ask on Piazza. Come to office hours. Have a good day.